Good morning, my friends. I'm Pastor Stephen Brooks, and welcome today to Morning Glory. Why don't you grab your Bibles and join me today in the book of First Kings, chapter, uh, chapter 3, and we'll take off in verse 5. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that as we go into Your Word, that Your Word would be illuminated by Your Holy Spirit, that the eyes of our heart would see the truths of Your Word, and that we can take them today and apply them to our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. And if you believe you receive, say Amen. Praise God. Verse 5, At Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask, what shall I give you? Verse 9, uh, here is the request on behalf of Solomon. Therefore give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to judge this great people of yours? An understanding heart, also in relation to wisdom, is really an ability to discern difference between good and evil. We actually see a biblical definition of wisdom here laid out in verse 9, the ability to discern between good and evil. Verse 10, the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Let's go down to verse 28. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had rendered, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. So this phenomenal ability to administer justice, to walk in wisdom, was given to Solomon on a magnificent level. Oh yes, he could discern difference. He could detail between right and wrong. He really knew how to ask the right questions, but he also was gifted with the extras. He had phenomenal knowledge, and he could lecture on all types of things. And uh, we really don't see this in the earth today because certain fields have become so specialized that there's no way that you could understand certain uh, uh, certain areas of science and so forth unless you have really studied it and you're, you're current and up to date because it's changing all the time. So uh, we don't have an area where you can sit down back like in those days you could be as they say a walking encyclopedia. But I don't think we've really had uh, anybody like that since maybe Isaac Newton uh, was maybe the last person who had this wide uh, based knowledge information that he just he was plugged into a lot of different things. But today you can take one field of um, of like uh, aerospace and that one field is so complex and, and so advanced that if you are in that field and you're not studying it full time you can get left behind. So there's no way you can know that and also everything else that's under the sun. Too much stuff today. But Solomon had a grace where he had this remarkable wisdom but also knowledge to somehow know all kinds of things about all kinds of stuff. And God just gave him a, a full package where royalty would come from other nations and just be astounded at his ability to give a discourse on almost any kind of topic. <laughs> so you think, how does this guy know all of this? Well, quite interesting. Praise the Lord. So a real gift that God had given him with uh, tangible results, even as we see in verse 28, and all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had rendered, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. So he asked for it, he got it, and everybody knew that he had it. And this was all a result of verse 5, uh, where it says, At Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask, what shall I give you? So, divine encounters, real experiences with a real God. These things still happen today. But I think it's remarkable that Solomon had such a uh, had such a wonderful walk with the Lord, and the gracious offerings that he would make to the Lord, and everything going so well, and such great potential, and in many ways, some historians call it the golden age of Israel. I think we could, uh, 
we could argue with that because although uh, from the surface it looked everything was golden, uh, if you if you kind of looked into it further, you you saw heavy taxation, you saw um, you saw a lot of problems. It certainly was a wasn't a utopian society by any means, but nevertheless he had tremendous wisdom, and there was peace. That's that's a big plus when you don't have to be concerned about. Uh, somebody dropping a bomb on you or something like that. That's just nice to have peace. Praise the Lord. So uh, remarkable wisdom, a very unique walk with the Lord, having a supernatural encounter with God. But my friends, as wonderful as this is, and as wonderful as wisdom is, and you know I love the wisdom of God. I actually, uh, I, I actually crave the wisdom of God. But you have to still understand that's not enough. That's, that's, that's a brilliant aspect of God's glory, of His character and, and, and His nature, but that's not enough to keep you. And may I present to you uh, a case study. Solomon himself drifted from the Lord. Oh yes, the man that walked with a spirit of wisdom all over him. And the Bible even highlights the value of wisdom. But there's more that's needed. And he had something missing, and the something missing, I think we can clearly see what it is here in just a few minutes. But the wisdom, as great as it is, that obviously is not the end result. Uh, spectacular knowledge, the ability to govern a nation, and all these wonderful things, the ability to create wealth, these wonderful things that still that's still not enough, because obviously it didn't keep Solomon. He had all of that. He had phenomenal wisdom, and it still did not keep him grounded. Let's go a little bit further. First Kings chapter 9. First Kings chapter 9, and look at verse 2. It's, uh, well, let, let, me, let me read verse 1. We'll have a better context understanding. And it came to pass, when Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord, and the king's house, and all Solomon's desire, which he wanted to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time, as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. Number two, let, let me ask you this, just between you and me. Have you ever had at least two divine encounters? Well, most people, most people haven't had even one real, how can we say, full-blown supernatural encounter where uh, you're having a, you know, one-on-one -on -one thing with God that happens. He had two. He had two, and he still blew it. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Oh, there's something deeper than the wisdom as, as much as we highlight wisdom, because it's a highlight in the Scriptures. As much as we highlight knowledge, because that's also given great value in, in the Scriptures, there has to be something else. There has to be something further. He had two divine appearances. Now, verse 2 again, the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. Verse 4, this is what the Lord told him. Now, if you walk before me as your father David walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then will I establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever, as I promised David your father, saying, You shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. But if you or your sons at all turn from following me, and do not keep my commandments and my statutes which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then what I will, excuse me, then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them, and this house which I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight. Israel will be a proverb and a byword among all peoples. So two spectacular supernatural encounters with the Lord, wisdom dispensed, instructions given, encouragement given, and great wealth, great prosperity, a time of national peace, and still, with all of that, with all of that, Solomon drifted from the Lord. We must look into this. We don't want the same thing to ever happen to us. You know, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it tells you that 
what happened to them talking about the Israelites their journeys and their their experiences what happened to them was an example for us it, it was all and it's all written and recorded why so that we can look at it and we can say oh these are the ones that made it let's find out what worked for them these are the ones that had failures and mistakes let's examine that also so that we don't make the same mistakes they made praise God let's continue on 1 Kings chapter 11 verse 1 now remember this is the king who had two supernatural encounters with the living God Jehovah verse 1 but King Solomon loved many foreign women and that's already a no-no God said don't God said do not you know have multiple wives God told them don't do that but yet he's disobeying he's disobeying that disobeying that you know I know in some ways we look at Solomon because he did a lot of things right but if you look at Solomon there's also some some examples of things that, that were not only done wrong but are going to be done, they're going to be done wrong again Solomon he brought peace to the entire Middle Eastern area the only person who's going to be able to do that again is going to be the Antichrist now Jesus will eventually do it he'll do it right but the Antichrist with the help of the false prophet the Antichrist is going to come on the scene and he is going to be the one that's going to broker the what we would call the Middle East peace treaty and he's going to do a lot of things that are going to go contrary to scripture such as dividing up Jerusalem and so forth but when you look at what Solomon did to get peace established in the Middle East during his time during his reign he had to violate scripture to do that and these international relationships that he had with neighboring countries he in order to have good relations would marry the king's daughter and then he would marry that king's daughter and then you know he's got all these international relations going on and establishing peace but you're establishing peace the wrong way now I know that was part of his legacy to be a man of peace but you want to have peace the right way you don't want to have a sense of false peace but King Solomon loved many foreign women as well as the daughter of Pharaoh this was this was the thing where it's not just the women and it's not just you know you know the Lord wanted Israel to leave Egypt behind and you don't you don't need further association with Egypt this was symbolism this was a this was an allegory for us you come out of the world and you don't need anything out of the sinful world that you need to be going back to you need to leave it and go on with the Lord praise God we're talking about the world as far as sin we're talking about leaving sin praise the Lord but Solomon also got involved in buying all of these horses from Egypt and the Lord told his people do not go back to Egypt don't even go back to buy those horses I know they've obviously got some really good horses don't let anything lure you back there so Solomon's violating all of that he's violating all of that but here the focus is on all of these heathen wives all of these idol worshiping demon worshiping wives that he married but King Solomon loved many foreign women as well as the daughter of Pharaoh women of the Moabites Ammonites Edomites Sidonians and Hittites from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel you shall not intermarry with them nor they with you surely they will turn away your heart your hearts after their gods Solomon clung to these in love and he had 700 wives princesses and uh, 300 concubines and his wives turned away his heart for it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God because it's very very important right there his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God as was the heart of his father David see David made mistakes he made several big blunders we all know the blunder he made with Bathsheba we also know the big blunder he made by numbering Israel uh, in other words uh, putting his trust in military might instead of the trust in God to protect them and uh, uh, several things that really 
caused problems for David and caused problems for the nation. But David never ever bowed down and worshipped an idol. David, David made mistakes, but David never was into idolatry. And David never forsook the Lord and began to worship other gods. And that here is what's going on with Solomon, the man who had two supernatural encounters with God. The man who walked in extraordinary wisdom of God, still, still, he fell away from the Lord. I want to read a little bit more, but of course, you know, it's a, I, I believe it's a good ending because the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, most scholars believe was written by Solomon after he repented of his sins and turned his heart back to the Lord. It's not a, it's not a very uh, cheerful book, but it is a book that gives a good overview of what Solomon went through and basically expressing the vanity of all of this, you know, flesh gone wild. And so, but that's his coming back home to the Lord. Okay. But let me read a little bit further and his falling away from the Lord. Verse five, for Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites, Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord as did his father David. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. And he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. And the Lord appeared to him and told him, don't, don't go after other gods. He, he gave him instructions, and Solomon went and completely broke them, even though he walked in wisdom. Of course, that wasn't wisdom, what he did. And, uh, but he, he had wisdom operating, he had prosperity, he had all kinds of good things going on in his life. But my friends, there's got to be something more. There's got to be something more. And I believe, I believe that we can find it. I just very quickly want to identify it to you, then we'll discuss it. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, 1 through 7. To the, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, that this is the Lord speaking to the church in Ephesus, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. I believe that as beautiful as the spirit of wisdom is resting on the person, that's wonderful, but you still need the whole package. You also need the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And that, that was something that Solomon just wasn't too interested in. But with the spirit of the fear of the Lord, a deep lo love and a reverence for the Lord, you also need what we would call the fruit of faithfulness. Praise God. You have the nine fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. See, Solomon had faithfulness missing from his life. Faithfulness. And that faithfulness to the Lord. And keeping the Lord your first love. Oh, there are so many things that will compete for the throneship of your heart. I mean, there's all kinds of things. But you have to let the Lord be on the throne of your heart, or else, or else you can drift. And you know, Solomon, he had a natural Achilles heel. And for him, it was just women, women, it really was just a spirit of lust. But he had areas that he went over into got away from the Lord. And it really caused problems. It really caused problems. Praise the Lord. My friends, we need to stay close to the Lord. The Lord told the church in Ephesus, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. So, if a situation like that is going on, what do you do? Well, you have to repent. 
You have to repent and then come back and get right with the Lord. Praise God. I think there can be a, you know, the initial phase of a person's life where they're saved, they're born again. And you just, you know, you devour the scriptures, you're in prayer, you're on fire for the Lord, you're, you're growing in the Lord. But, you know, over a period of time, it is possible that things will compete for your attention, for your love, for your devotion. And I believe that the Lord is worthy and deserving of being the king of our heart. And he needs to always be our first love. When, when Jesus is your first love, you're never going to have, you're never going to have a Solomon drifting experience that will never ever happen to you. And remember, this all comes down to a daily walk. If you walk close to the Lord every day, then that day will turn eventually into a week. A week turns into a month. The months turn into a year. A year turns into years, and you live your life close to the Lord, but you have to do it every day. Jesus has to be the love of your life. He has to be the love of your life. He really wants to be, but we have to, we have to set Him on the throne of our hearts. I believe there's a danger in just getting so busy, working, 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 even doing good things, uh, even for the Lord, uh, where where even the Lord pointed that out to the church and lay out, excuse me, there in Ephesus, you're doing all these things. Uh, you're, you're doing a lot of work, and it's, and it's good work, but you've, you've lost your first love. And I think a lot of people cover up that drifting with activity. And there's nothing wrong with activity, as long as the, you're still really close to the Lord. But if you're doing all this activity, um, you have to really watch out, because you can keep drifting. And, have, and then get busier and busier, and drift a little further, just, you know, uh, fill in the gap with something else. But my friends, we're coming into the time where the glory of the Lord is going to be seen. Now, this is very real. We're talking about the return of the, the tangible, visible even, glory of God. Hallelujah. You really need to, need to consider the, the hour in which we're living. You need to walk close to the Lord, because wonderful, wonderful things are about to happen amongst God's people. That's you. In the world, it's going to get darker and darker. But for us, it's going to get brighter and brighter. Praise the Lord. So I want to encourage you to have faithfulness in your life. I want to encourage you to desire the wisdom of God. I certainly do. But I want you to also understand that's not enough. You need more. You need a close walk with the Lord. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Well, Solomon obviously did. Somewhere along that line, where initially he was so dependent on the Lord, crying out to God, God, I've got to have you. Having supernatural encounters with God extended discussions where God's giving him detailed information, and then drifting, drifting. Why? Other things begin to captivate him more than the Lord. That's when he got in trouble. That's when he began to compromise. And I, I just felt led of the Holy Spirit to say, although it's good to be busy, it's good to accomplish great things, and you are going to do great things, don't ever drift from the core thing which is to have a strong relationship, close walk with the Lord, where you really are in love with the Lord. Hallelujah. Some things you can't fix overnight. Some things you can't fix in the day. So you have to just settle in with your faith, work on it with your faith, and just don't, don't let things upset you and trouble you. Just keep moving forward on faith projects in your calling, in God's assignment for your life, and just worship the Lord. Say, Lord, it is what it is. Some things, they are what they are. Everything's changing. Everything's working out for good. Some things may be a little bit slower than I had had, that, that I had uh, hoped for. But, but when you love the Lord, when you love the Lord, um, a lot of things that may potentially bug you or bother you, they won't. They won't. If something just tries to, um, how can we say uh, in, our, in our American culture, get beneath your skin, in other words, irritate you or upset you, then you just need to go and get close to the Lord and worship the Lord. 
worship the Lord. You need to have those moments where you're so close to the Lord, that spirit of worship catches you and lifts you right into the presence of God. You've got to have those types of moments where Jesus really is your first love. There's always going to be work to do. There's, there, until we go home to be with God, there's always going to be something else to do. But along the way, don't ever drift from the most important thing, which is a close walk with the Lord. Nevertheless, I have this against you. That was the situation with Solomon. May it not be so for us, where he said, you have left your first love. Praise the Lord. Well, if you've drifted, get right back. Get right back and just stay in that place daily. It's a daily walk. Praise God. Heavenly Father, I pray for your people that there be no deceptive drifting. We thank you, Father God, that even, even with uh, wealth, uh, Father, we thank you that we also know that wealth brings a lot of options for recreation and entertainment and, and things to do with our time. And Father, we certainly thank you for that. But Father, let us stay close to you. Let us stay in the secret place. Let us stay in the Holy of Holies. We know that we have activities, we have work, things we have to do. But Father, help us to stay focused because your glory is coming. And we, we are destined to be a part of this. Now Father, we thank you. We thank you, O oh God. Hallelujah. You're talking to your people during this, during this season, during this time. It's very important that we're not too busy. Father, we give you praise. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, there's a few of you I'm getting in the spirit. You've gotten so um, uh, engulfed in a project or something that uh, it's just like you're, you're running day and night. This thing's taking up your thoughts, and you need to come back to the Lord. I'm not saying, you know, you, you shut the project down, but I, I'm saying you need a break. You absolutely need to step back, and you need a break, and you need to get your heart right with the Lord, where, where He's your first love. Praise God. It, it doesn't matter if you discovered a gold mine in your backyard, and now, now, you're, now you're a billionaire. That, that, that's great. Okay, uh, set, set, the, set the gold down, and come back and, and worship the Lord. Always keep the Lord center in your life. Amen. And we won't have any Solomon drifting experiences. Praise God. You won't ever have to write a book uh, about your backslidings and, and uh, you know, praise God. I mean, Ecclesiastes is a good book. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit. But, you know, this is not like a bubbly story. This is a guy that blew it and missed it and wasted a lot of his time because he drifted from the Lord. That's not going to be your testimony. You're going to walk with the Lord and you're going to stay close. Let's take communion together. Praise God. I believe, I believe the presence of the Lord is here. Praise the Lord. And if you've drifted, come right back right now. He'll meet you right now, restore you, wash your sins away, and let Him always be your anchor. Praise God. Stay right next to Him. First love. In love with Him. Not just serving Him. Any, any believer can serve God, but you love Him. Hallelujah. Father, we thank You for the bread and the juice. We bless it. We consecrate it. We thank you. This is now the flesh and the blood of Jesus, our Savior. Thank you, Father, for his body. Thank you, Father, for a close walk with you. And we just say as we receive his body, no drifting, no drifting away. We're actually getting closer. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's receive. I believe faithfulness is being released into you right now. Hallelujah. Faithfulness is being released into you right now. Faithful to the Lord. Faithful to the Lord. In love with the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The fruit of faithfulness. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Father God, for access into the holy place, into your very presence, through Christ's shed blood. Father, we receive his blood and it's cleansing power now in Jesus name let's receive
Praise God. Hallelujah. Look for those moments you sense that that grace to worship. Well, just start singing a song to the Lord. Just if you're by yourself, just you know, just start singing that song to the Lord and watch the Holy Spirit carry you right into the presence of the Heavenly Father. Glory to God and just go with it and and just worship the Lord. Love on the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, bless your people today. We thank you. We thank you that we will never drift. That you, Father, your Son Jesus, your Holy Spirit, you, O oh God, are our first love. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, thank you, Father. Amen. Thanks for watching. I'll see you back next time.